Well, welcome everybody. Thank you so much for joining us. I'm Pam Metzger. I'm the director of the Decent Criminal Justice Reform Center at SMU Dedman School of Law. And it's my pleasure to welcome you here today. Uh, the Decent Center is a research and advocacy center located at SMU Dedman School of Law. And we have three areas of expertise. We focus on the right to counsel from beginning to end with a strong emphasis on public defender and appointed counsel systems as well as on access to counsel for those folks who are entitled to the assistance of counsel and don't receive it. A second area of focus is prosecutorial discretion and the exercise of that discretion in screening and charging decisions. And the third area, which is the area we're focusing on today, is our STAR justice program, that's small tribal and rural criminal justice systems. Those are systems um, that have characteristics in common. That's why we study them together at the Decent Center. And those three primary characteristics of our star justice systems are that they experience distance. So they're isolated from other justice systems. They have low caseload volumes, which means they don't have the economies of scale that larger systems have. And generally they experience um, lawyer scarcity along with other professional scarcities. So a prevalence of legal deserts and small tribal and rural criminal justice systems, star justice systems um, are all to one degree or another affected or driven by those three factors. And so um, they've been largely left out of the national criminal justice conversation. It's part of our mission to bring the criminal justice reform conversation to those communities and more important to make sure that the national community is aware that star justice communities can and should be part of that conversation, that they have important innovations to offer um, to the larger national community. So with that, I'm going to um, turn to our panel today. Anybody who's practiced in tribal communities or who practices in the federal criminal justice system knows that uh, criminal practice in Indian nations has been rocked by the Supreme Court's decision in McGirt versus Oklahoma, which was a critically important and I think somewhat unexpected decision about tribal sovereignty and federal courts. And today's panel is um, just an amazing group of experts who are gonna teach us about this opinion, help us understand what it means for practice and what we can expect to see in the future. Um, professor Matthew, Matthew Fletcher is the Professor of Law and Director of Indigenous Law and Policy Center at the Michigan State University of Law. Um, he's the reporter for the ALI, uh, his Restatement of the Law on American Indians. He's published horn books, treatises, and case books, including the only case book for law students on tribal law. Um, he's the editor of the Turtle Talk blog, sits as the Chief Justice of the Porch Ban of the Creek Indian Supreme Court, and as an appellate judge for tribes all over the country. Um, and he is a member of the Grand Traverse Band of Ottawa and Chippewa Nations. We also have Julia O'Connell. She is the public, federal public defender for the Northern and Eastern Districts of Oklahoma, a position she's had since uh, 2008, although she's been a public defender um, in state and federal courts since 1990. She's been uh, a member of the Defender Services Death Penalty Working Group. She currently sits as the 10th Circuit Representative to the Defender Services Advisory Group for the Administrative Office of Courts. Those of you who aren't familiar with the federal court system, that's the way everything is. Lots and lots and lots of words to say that she sits and advises the federal government on what's actually happening in the 10th Circuit. Um, and she's also been a member of the editorial board of the NACDL's Champion Public and last but certainly not least, Philip Tinker, who's an attorney at Kanji and Katzen. Um, he's a member of the Osage Nation. Um, he's been instrumental in a lot of um, the litigation that's gone on, um, including the Muscogee Creek Nation in the Tenth Circuit, among other places. Um, Philip's represented tribal interests in a wide variety of cases, not just criminal cases, but also um, civil cases. Um, before he was a lawyer in his firm, he worked for um, the chief judge of the Court of Appeals for the Eighth Circuit, and he's published a couple of articles, again, about tribal sovereignty. Um, so with that, I'm simply going to um, turn it over to Philip and ask him if he can tell us a little bit about McGirt, and we're going to try and lay a foundation here in our first few minutes of understanding what the case is about, what the tribal sovereignty issues are, and what it looks like in federal courts right now. And then from there, I'm going to sit back, shut up, and let our panelists take it. So, Philip, why don't you start us off telling us a little bit about Mr. McGirt in this case? Yes, thank you, Professor Metzger, and thank you for to the Decent Center for putting on this, um, you know, really important, and I hope uh, for the audience, very interesting panel. 
Um, we are here to discuss the Supreme Court's recent decision in two related cases. The one everybody talks about is McGirt versus Oklahoma. The companion case was Murphy versus Oklahoma. And both of these cases came to the Supreme Court recently to question the received and uh, previously more or less settled assumption on the part of most of the state of Oklahoma and the rest of the country that Indian country within the state of Oklahoma, Eastern Oklahoma in particular, had been largely divested, eroded by the forces of history. And you know, tribal sovereignty was limited to very small and discrete parcels. The large land bases of the Indian territory reservations of the five tribes um, presumed up until that point no longer to be intact and extant. Um, the Supreme Court informed everyone that that was not the case just because um, officials in the state of Oklahoma, the federal government, and most people you'd ask on the street thought there was no such thing as an Oklahoma reservation. That doesn't make that the case, and the Supreme Court told us why. And you know that's what we'll be exploring in more detail on this panel. The case, um, I'm not going to belabor the entire history of the five tribes in Oklahoma and their removal and establishment of governments in the Indian Territory, but I think it is important to recognize a little bit of where that history begins for the purpose of this decision. And uh, the five tribes uh, known at points in history as the five civilized tribes, but um, you know, referred to as the five tribes generally now, um, originally during the um, you know, early um, establishment of the United States government had um, land bases and communities in the eastern, southeastern uh, part of the country in Florida, Georgia, Alabama, um, you know, in, in this territory. And they were generally prosperous, well-educated, and, um, you know, more or less, um, you know, fairly well integrated into the societies there. They had um, many representatives, uh, many tribal members, educated at Harvard, Yale, and Princeton, participating in local and national politics. Um, a big part of the farming and, you know, certainly, you know, unfortunately the plantation economies there but they were they were economically and politically prosperous and powerful and the federal government often espouses the idea that this is the the goal and the ideal for the federal indian policy is well integrated um, you know tribal communities that participate in the western economy and the politics when that actually happens um, they are less um, less accepting of that than the, the policy would espouse. And it was, it was very unpopular at the time for the five tribes to have that kind of economic and political clout. And so the removal policy in the 1830s was instituted to take the tribes from what was their home at the time and forcibly relocate to um, Oklahoma where they set up the reservation system in the state of Oklahoma um, from the 1830s and you know through the the rest of the 1800s, it at the turn of the century into the 1900s, a series of the policy was implemented to reduce the reservation land base, which was collectively held tribal land, and reallocate the lands to individual tribal members um, as their separate property. This was a different system of land ownership than had previously been um, you know, the, uh, the policy for tribal land ownership. And the question arose um, for these tribes and across the country after a, an allotment distributing the land base to individual tribal members, does that reduce the tribal government's authority and jurisdiction over that territory? Very often it is assumed in practice to have done so by the, uh, the governments at the time, especially right after an allotment takes place. State authorities come in, start to exercise jurisdiction and authority, often without actual legal basis to do so. It was authority in fact, but not authority in law. In Oklahoma, that um, 
That is what happened. The state of Oklahoma assumed de facto jurisdiction over the five tribes territories. And it wasn't really subject to concerted legal challenge until um, in uh, around the year 2000, a Creek tribal member named Patrick Murphy was prosecuted by the state of Oklahoma for committing a murder within the allotted Creek territory on land that was no longer owned by a tribal member, had fallen out of individual ownership, but was within the original reservation territory. And this raises the question of, did those, um, did the allotment of the reservation on the eve of statehood in Oklahoma divest the tribe of its jurisdiction over that territory? Because had the lands been part of a continuing extant reservation, the state of Oklahoma would have no authority over that uh, murder. That would be a federal, um, that would be a federal crime to be prosecuted under the federal government. You know, an interesting side note, which gave this case extra importance for the, uh, for the petitioner, Mr. Murphy, the state of Oklahoma had the death penalty for that crime. The federal government did not. So for him, it was very much a, a critical issue of not just which, which government is going to try him and whether he'll be in state or federal custody, but whether or not he's eligible for capital punishment. So I, I wanted to just to jump in here and, and ask, um, Philip, and thank you for that explanation. I wanted to ask, just highlighting that, right? That, And I wanted to, to maybe Matthew can take this one. Can you talk a little bit about what that looks like in terms of the, the, the competing interests of sovereignty on the one hand, right, and and defendant concerns and choices and, and kind of what is the tribal interest in asserting jurisdiction under those circumstances? I, have to, I think I have to start at the beginning, um, you know, the beginning of the history of the United States in some ways, and then I, I will definitely get to your answer. So um, way back in the day, they, the, the theory uh, was an international law theory, the theory of the relationship between the United States and Indian tribes is a theory that we still talk about today. It's called the duty of protection. So the occasionally uh, a, a bigger superior sovereign, so to speak, will uh, take a smaller, weaker, inferior sovereign under its wing. And uh, I often refer to this as the United States nuclear umbrella. And um, it's uh, designed to make sure that, um, that the bigger sovereign has uh, basically control over the external sovereignty of a sovereign within its midst. In this case, you have 574 federally recognized tribes now in, within the exterior boundaries of the United States, um, with, with the possible exception of, exception of Kickapoo, which is partially in Mexico, but uh, that's, we'll set that aside for now. The studio protection was uh, theorized under international customary law as a a uh, theory that um, would allow those uh, smaller sovereigns to retain their internal sovereignty. And whatever the, the, the scope of that is, is to be negotiated between the two sovereigns. And that is uh, memorialized in the Constitution. So within the Constitution and the Commerce Clause in particular, a listing of sovereigns that are important within the United States, within and without. We see states, of course states. We see foreign nations, of course foreign nations. And you see Indian tribes, they're on the same line and uh, within the text of the constitution, uh, again, the Commerce Clause. So what is it that these Indian nations are? And um, that has always been subject to negotiation for the first century or so between the US and tribes through the treaty process. The constitution uh, delegates powers to the federal government exclusively to deal with foreign nations uh, through the treaty process. And until 1871, formally, uh, Indian tribes are treated effectively as foreign nations, even though that uh, fairly early on, even at the beginning, uh, there were tribes within the interior boundaries of the 13 original states, most famously the Cherokee Nation, uh, which is located in large part in Georgia. So uh, what is this relationship is critically important. And more important, I think, for our purposes today is who can actually determine what that relationship is. Uh, as I said, it primarily originates through that, that relationship is negotiated through the treaty process. Now, the US, the US, for whatever reason, stopped formally negotiating treaties with Indian tribes in 1871, but that relationship really hasn't changed all that much. You still, even today, you still have a, uh, an annual funding agreement, for example, that tribes negotiate with the United States government exclusively. Um, to determine really the governance and the funding for governance in Indian country. And that is a federal 
and tribal negotiation. It is not a negotiation involving any private interests, uh, other American citizens, and certainly not state or local governments. And um, that's really the, the core of the duty of protection is the US owes this obligation to Indian tribes. Uh, Indian tribes have, uh, have paid for that obligation in blood um, and in soil and resources, uh, even their culture and their children throughout the history of the United States. And that obligation that the United States owes to the tribes is the duty of protection. Uh, the problem is that you have these other interests that uh, for whatever reason have acted to interfere with that relationship. And quite possibly the two biggest famous or infamous interests that have interfered with that relationship are the state governments themselves and the United States Supreme Court. The, the rules uh, of Indian law really are very simple. Uh, there is a federal tribal relationship and the supremacy clause of the constitution forbids states and anyone else from participating in that relationship, from interfering uh, with, with their, the assertion of their laws, the assertion of their power, et cetera, et cetera, absent um, an act of Congress. And within the federal government, it is Congress and Indian tribes that have the primary relationship. Yes, Congress has delegated substantial powers to uh, administer Indian affairs to the executive branch. Hence, you have you know, the Assistant Secretary for Indian Affairs, a Bureau of Indian Affairs, Bureau of Indian Education, Indian Health Service, all the Indian Affairs offices, et cetera, et cetera. Um, the judiciary until really throughout most of the 20th century stayed out of Indian Affairs. What the judiciary would do prim primarily the Supreme Court is say, um, you know, it's really not our business. They almost treated it to the, almost to the point of calling political question. Whenever Congress would pass a law in Indian Affairs, the Supreme Court would say, that's between y'all and has nothing to do with us. We don't even know how to assess this matter. This is effectively a question of foreign affairs. We'll leave it alone. Um, so there are these, these default interpretive rules that the Supreme Court has employed since well within the 19th century. Rules that say things like, whenever a treaty is to be interpreted um, between, uh, whenever, whenever an Indian treaty is to be interpreted, will interpret that treaty to the benefit of the, the tribes if there is an ambiguity. Similarly with an Indian affairs statute designed to uh, assist or um, help Indian affairs, that will also be interpreted uh, to the benefit of tribal interests. And um, if there is an act of, if a tribe has established a property right or a right of power, um, a reservation boundary, a treaty right, Congress, it is true, can um, alter or modify or even abrogate one of those rights. But the Supreme Court's core interpretive rule always has been, um, if Congress is going to do that, they have the power, they have to come right out and say so. We call that the clear statement rule. And the problem of course is since the 1970s in particular, the Supreme Court um, has ignored the clear statement rule. And in fact has intervened pretty extensively and egregiously in, um, in, these, in this area for matters of, as a matter of policy. It'll even say in its opinions, we don't think this reservation boundary exists anymore because there's a bunch of non-Indians living in it. So it can't possibly that the reservation exists. And that uh, status on the ground is something that um, uh, as, as Phil very eloquently stated, you know, becomes the law effectively on the ground and Supreme Court usually just reads a bunch of newspaper articles and amicus briefs and you know, the, obviously the merits briefs and says it looks like it's not Indian country anymore, so it must not be. But in the past five, six, seven years or so, I'd say since 2014 and Michigan versus Bay Mills, the Supreme Court has reinvigorated the clear statement rule. They, they're textualists and the more conservative judges uh, don't enter introduce policy into their decisions. They look at the law, they follow the precedent. The precedent in Indian law has always been clear. These default interpretive rules govern because the relationship is exclusively between tribes and Congress, not between the states and the Supreme Court. It is a, tri a relationship that is, um, has, has existed since the beginning of the United States. It is memorialized in the constitution and there's not a lot to say. Um, ironically, despite the fact that we always think of Indian law as being incredibly complicated, creating all sorts of unusual and sometimes confusing and even illiberal acts, Indian law, if you follow it the way the court has all followed it up until recent decades, has always been a very easy 
uh, interpretive decision making process. Uh, I'll leave it at that and just point out that, you know, when a tribe has a reservation that it's as negotiated for um, through the treaty process or through an act of Congress or even through uh, the creation of a reservation through executive order, um, that is a tribal homeland. And everything that occurs on that reservation um, is impacts the tribe and its members. And there are mores that go all the way up and down. Uh, federal and state law are um, antithetical to many things that Indian people, Indian cultures are, and tribal governments have a significant interest in things like the death penalty. That's obviously a very um, cutting edge issue as a hot topic. But even something as simple as what the statute of limitations is for an employment discrimination claim. You know, you can see a state like Oklahoma. I'm not picking on Oklahoma particularly because I don't know the outcome there, but I can only imagine that in some states that have more uh, protect, more statutes protective of, say, government and big business as opposed to individuals and consumers and criminal defendants, um, that if to the importation of that law into Indian country for many tribes is really not what those tribal communities want to be about. Thank you so much. So I'm going to bounce back to Philip, who I interrupted because I wanted to get a little background for our audience um, from Matthew to ask you if you can just give us kind of, there's no Cliff Notes version, but if you can summarize for us then what McGirt looks like against that backdrop, what, what was the case about and what, what was the holding? Yes, absolutely. Thank you. And both the Murphy and McGirt cases can be cliff noted fairly easily because what you see is uh, members of the Muscogee Creek Nation committing a you know, criminal offense within the borders recognized under the Creek Nation's 1866 treaty with the United States, which said, this shall be your homeland. These boundaries shall be the territory that um, you know, has been Pro promised to you, protected for you, shall be your reservation. And it's pretty simple under federal criminal statutes, 18 USC 1151 and 1153, people who commit the um, types of crimes that were committed here, serious offenses under federal and state law, if they are tribal members and if they're within a reservation that is a federal offense, if they are not within a reservation, if they're not within Indian country, um, generally that's going to be a state offense. So when the state prosecuted these two gentlemen and they said, wait a minute, I'm on a reservation, 1866 treaty says I'm on a reservation, you don't have any jurisdiction to try me here, this is a federal matter if anything. So they, they have habeas corpus petitions going into um, the federal courts actually. Mr. Murphy filed habeas corpus, uh, Mr. McGirt got searched directly from a state uh, court of criminal appeals decision. But in both cases, they take their matter to the federal courts to say the state has no jurisdiction over these crimes because it's a reservation, because we're tribal members, because that is a federal and a tribal jurisdiction, not a state jurisdiction over Indians in Indian country. Thank you. So all of this bounces it, um, I think, as I understand it, a lot of this leads to um, unprecedented volume of new litigation landing in the federal courts, which leads me directly to Julia O'Connell and the Federal Public Defender Services. And uh, when we talked, I know I was kind of staggered by the numbers that you gave us. Can you talk a little bit about what McGirt means um, for federal criminal practice and what you're seeing? Sure. Uh, well, to start off, right, there is an explosion of, of new criminal filings uh, Right now, I would say it's in the neighborhood of five to six times what we've seen in the past in both districts. Um, we expect that it could get to be as much as 15 times the volume of cases, um, particularly in the Eastern District of Oklahoma. And um, that's because uh, if McGirt is extended the way that uh, we believe it should be to include um, the remaining tribes of the five tribes, Almost the entirety of these, the, the federal um, judicial district, the Eastern District of Oklahoma, would be then Indian country, right? So what we've seen right now, because of very recent cases decided, uh, the Bossy case and the Hogner case in particular, we've seen a, a, a new um, uptick, cases that are expected to be dismissed rather, rather quickly with the, uh, um, in the Northern District with the Cherokee tribe, um, We've got 
I think this week I've I've tried to find counsel to represent um, defendants in nine different murder cases. And I should say that my office maybe has taken, has had to take or, or um, farm out two murders in the last three years. That's how infrequent we see murder filings in the Northern District of Oklahoma. They're more common in the Eastern District, but still the numbers that we've, we've seen already are, are just astronomical. Uh, so the challenge that we face is, is of course, finding qualified counsel to, to represent the defendants charged in these particular cases. There, there are two different kinds, basically, of cases that we're seeing. We're seeing newly committed offenses that are being filed as right as they occur. And then we're also seeing this flood of cases from the state court. And this is actually quite a shame. Um, we've seen cases that are four years old that have been pending for four years with no justice in, in state court, but where the people have, where the defendants have McGirt claims and, and have filed motions to have their cases dismissed. So in anticipation that those motions will be granted, the government's now filed complaints in, in federal court. So, um, and then, the, uh, and I guess we also have the habeas cases, which are coming slowly, but surely. I think we just uh, assigned um, a case. The defendant's name is Good, Clarence Good, G-O-O-D-E, uh, who was on death row for a bit um, in Oklahoma. Now, the good news for, for him is that that won't happen when, when he's prosecuted federally, uh, but he will be prosecuted federally, most certainly. I'm not seeing very, very much appetite on the part of the government so far in major crimes cases to to forego prosecution, even if someone has, you know, served a substantial sentence thus far. Um, but we'll see as as time goes on and as the numbers increase, whether whether that opportunity actually ever exists for anyone. Um, the the flood of cases does not just impact the defender. Uh, right and 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 uh, supplying counsel but it also impacts the court uh, the, the way the court functions the, the federal court uh, um, increasing the the judicial numbers to get new judges I think you the, they require um, the judiciary itself requires two years of of um, a 25 percent uptick in cases before they will actually go to their own internal governments to seek additional funding for new positions, new, new judicial positions from Congress. So any new judges, that's out there a bit, um, right? So judges will have to volunteer from around the country to pop in once in a while and try a case. Um, then there's the entire court staff. Um, the probation office sees an increase in work, right? The, the Marshal Service, the Department of Justice has its Bureau of Prisons to now worry about a, a great increase in prisoners or supervision. And then there's, of course, the United States Attorney's Office. Um, and they're, they're challenged when it comes to resources to do that, but they're to, to handle this, but they're not, they're, their challenges are nothing like um, the challenges that, that are faced on the defense side of things. They've got the power of the Department of Justice, and uh, I think I've seen a, a a doubling and better, maybe even a, tr a tripling of criminal line attorney numbers in both of my districts. Right in, in the in the past, I think our, our ratio was one defender to seven U.S. attorneys. <laughs> now it's now it's uh, a little bit worse than that, but I mean that's. You know, just a part of the part of the game. We'll see how how it works, how it shakes out over the next uh, many months. Uh, funding is coming our way. You know, we 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 see a lot of. I think for us, the biggest increase, the, the biggest challenge is the increase in numbers and ensuring that we can find qualified counsel. So let me ask this question, and I'll, anyone who wants to can jump in and and answer it. 
It seems to me that that there are competing interests here for for Indian defendants and Indian and, and tribes, right? Um, and Julia, Julia knows where this is going. I can see that face. Um, what what is this conflict, and how should we be thinking about it? Um, what are the competing interests here? Well, someone's already mentioned the death penalty, mm -hmm. right? The, the, and, and of course, the state's fighting to keep convicted persons that they've gotten the death verdict on, right? Mm -hmm. Um, so there, there's that, um, a big piece of it, but I also think that, that, that there's a, a real struggle over, over resources. The, the, the state seems to not seems to, I see in various arguments that are advanced by the state that this is going to be a tremendous challenge on the resources of the federal government. And from my view, um, the resources that I have available to me to defend a case are, are far, far greater than the resources available in any of the state defense systems, whether it's the public defender office or, or what. We just have more and, um, and, and we can handle cases uh, in, in, I think, a, a better way. We don't have crush, crushing numbers traditionally uh, and I think even though we've got a minor crisis, I know my agency will respond and will not allow my office to be crushed by numbers, right? There, there is a standard that, that we adhere to, and um, that's not going to change because we suddenly have 15 times more cases. We will, you know, we'll get it done. So, so for me, I think there is, there is a desire on the part of, of prosecutorial minded um, people who are advocating for, for more state jurisdiction to be able to ensure that people are, are, remain on death row and that, that punishments um, are high. They, in Oklahoma, jury sentencing is a thing. That's right. So you see these sentences like the the, what was it, a thousand years plus life, I think was Mr. McGirt's sentence. I, who, who can serve a thousand years plus life? That's really pretty silly, right? But <laughs> it means something to someone. And, and um, I, I just think that, that the arguments that are being made by the state are, are made by prosecutorial minded people who, who want to keep prisoners in place. And, and they've got an interest in the finality of judgments. That makes sense, right? And the finality of sentences and finality for victims, all, all of that makes perfect sense. So, but that's my take on, on one reason why we have this struggle. Matthew, Philip, y'all want to jump in here? I have, I, have a, I have a slightly different take. And, um, you know, I think that what Julia was talking about in terms of state politics, it's, um, you know, it's hard to watch from a dis even distance. I would imagine it'd be harder to watch while you're, if you're right there in Oklahoma uh, to see the state, uh, state political actors really exploit this um, in a way that I think is really quite um, disturbing. But that's actually not what I, I wanna talk about. I, I think that the, the federal government's response here is a real key indicator for um, what some of the bigger issues are in Indian country criminal jurisdiction more generally. Mm -hmm. uh, I was on a panel at the beginning of the school year back in August, September uh, with Kevin Washburn, the Dean at Iowa, who is a former federal prosecutor. And um, you know, the, you know, I got my black lives matter shirt on today. So uh, we were, we weren't on, we weren't on, on four, four quarters. Uh, on, you know, we weren't all in total agreement on everything. Um, that night, but we both agreed that there is a real interesting problem in Indian country, which is um, there is an enormous amount of crime in Indian country. And uh, the crime rates in Indian country have been going up for decades at the same time that crime rates in pretty much every other area of the country, every demographic have been going down. And um, you know, my, my argument is from the federal Indian law perspective is that that's partially the Supreme Court's fault in stripping tribes of even misdemeanor jurisdiction over non-Indians. Um, it's partially Congress's fault in not addressing that uh, that issue. But you know, the, the United States could prosecute more cases in Indian country. They could really be the first responder if they wanted to. I don't know if that's what Indian country wants, 
but um, the declination rate for Indian country criminal cases is very high. I mean, that the federal government just is not dedicated to the to responding to things like, um, you know, misdemeanor domestic violence. You know, and there's some pushback to, to from Congress, some more funding resources policy to push back on some of that. And maybe there are some changes, but uh, this is a huge area of Indian country that nobody was treating as Indian country for a long time, and now suddenly it is. And it'll be, I'm curious to see from Julia's perspective, it sounds like the government has come out um, all guns blazing, relatively speaking, compared to the rest of Indian country where you're not gonna get a lot of response uh, from the feds a lot of the time. You know, there's a lot of complaints from people in Indian country when the tribes refer cases to the federal government, you might hear from them in two years, you might not. And, um, you know, I, I think this is a moment where Indian country needs to pay attention to how the federal government responds to the, this new uh, era, this new regime in Oklahoma. And, uh, you know, they could do that everywhere. Let me just ask Philip, anything you want to add there? Sure. I think uh, both Matthew and Julie are making, you know, really excellent points here. I agree with all of that. I think I'm just going to add in that another unique circumstance, um, it doesn't have to be unique, but I think functionally it's rather unique in the Indian country um, criminal context is the system is set up to allow a, a higher level of coordination between the tribal government and the federal government in terms of criminal prosecution that I think is always exercised. Um, some tribes try to be on the forefront of this. It's usually going to be the tribes that take the initiative and sort of push the, um, the federal partners in the direction they want to go. But there are programs authorizing the tribes to designate tribal attorneys to be um, designated um, assistant U.S. attorneys prosecuting on behalf of the federal government um, a, an attorney on the tribal payroll. They can do the same thing from the public defense side. They can designate, um, you know, have a have a tribal defense clinic. I see Julia's face saying maybe that's not happening as much as she would like. There's always politics about funding public defenders compared to funding prosecution, right? But they could do it. <laughs> I have known tribes that have been very active in setting up good public defense clinics. Every government ostensibly has this interest, but I think tribal governments there's an opportunity for them to be more closely connected to all of the people involved. They have a very strong interest in keeping their citizens and their population safe. As Matthew was saying, the, the crime rate in Indian country is very high and tribes take that very, very seriously. They want to protect all their people. They also have, you know, tribes sometimes uh, at the risk of essentializing, I don't wanna do that. Sometimes tribes are more close-knit communities, um, more people know the victim as well as the um, defendant and they want to do justice to everybody. So there can be a lot of opportunity for even if most of the major crimes are being prosecuted at the federal level, there are opportunities for the tribes to come to the table and add more resources to that. There are also opportunities for the federal government to give more resources to the tribes to help them establish their own justice systems and strengthen the response that they have now. So it takes work, it takes resources and funding at every level, but there's a lot of opportunity as much as there's also gonna be necessary disruption and, and reallocation of resources as you're moving defendants from, from one government to the other. Well, thanks for jumping in there, Philip. Julia, go ahead. Well, I think building an infrastructure, uh, particularly a, a, a criminal prosecution court uh, the the whole thing from top to bottom, from detention to prosecuting to defending, is a is a really big proposition, and um, the best uh, I think even the best of of intentions would just take an awfully long time and a, and a big commitment to be able to build that. The um, the, the McGirt cases, I mean, the strictly McGirt cases, if we're going to talk about Major Crimes Act cases, murders, sexual assaults, robberies, et cetera, I, in my experience, I, I, don't, I don't think that you're going to see much declination from 
federal prosecutors on those kinds of cases. To talk about any of the other discretionary jurisdiction cases that, that the federal government could have, historically, the United States Attorney's Office wants to have a high conviction rate. So everything that they look at, everything they review, what's brought to them is scrutinized from, you know, and is this, is this provable readily out of hand? How much, how much can I guarantee that this will actually result in a conviction? That's where I, that's where I think uh, something contributing to investigations, um, to the cooperation between the tribes and the federal prosecutors could go a long way to to um, to seeing the federal prosecutors take on more of those cases. So the, the, I don't think they'll ever change the way they scrutinize cases and, and the way they want to maintain that 98 or whatever it is these days percent conviction rate. That's that's a goal for them. And so my, what I'm hearing, and for those folks who are watching who are students who may need some context, um, prosecutors don't have to take every case, right? They can decide not to prosecute a referral from police or from the FBI, and that's called a declination. And so part of the conversation here is about what cases prosecutors are choosing to pursue um, and how they make those decisions. So let me ask this. Um, we've had a, a couple of questions in the chat, and I know we've talked about this um, when we were prepping. For all those folks who are sitting in jail all over the country and who are looking around and saying, huh, what does this McGirt case mean for me? What should I be doing? Um, and for all those tribal communities that are thinking about law enforcement, public safety, and are looking at each other and saying, okay, what do we do next? What does McGirt mean for, for people um, across the country right now? Well, I think McGirt is an invitation for, for, for tribes to, to uh rise up and show um, that they can and, and will um, embrace this, uh, this decision, uh, right? Embrace the sovereignty um, and, and build an infrastructure on every level they need to. I, mean, I, I, I think that's one thing. Matthew, are there tribes that don't want this kind of sovereignty? I mean, what are you hearing? There are a lot of tribes that um, are reluctant to assert criminal jurisdiction over even their own members. Most of those tribes are in public law 280 states or that have limited resources, or they may have significant internal political opposition to a retributive justice system that is mm -hmm. our adversarial system. The tribes that uh, would like very much to have this jurisdiction because they have soaring crime rates and problems with violence on the reservation Mm -hmm. tend to be the tribes that don't have the resources to do much about it. The problem with declinations is that outside of Indian country, when the feds decline to prosecute, it's not that big of a deal because the state can always step up. Right. That's mm -hmm. not always true in, in, inside of Indian country. Right. And um, the tribes don't have jurisdiction over non-Indians except in extraordinary limited circumstances. And so non-Indians know that they can go to Indian country and commit crimes almost with impunity. So it's really difficult. Um, so can I ask, I'm going to stop there for a second, because because I want to ask you if you could just, or if you or Philip or someone can elaborate on that, because it's an incredibly important point, particularly in the context of this um, sort of an epidemic of missing and, and murdered Indigenous women and girls, this notion that we are creating prosecution-free zones for, for non-Indians. Um, and it might be helpful to walk through that if somebody could for us. I'll, I'll jump in. Go for there, it. We haven't talked about 280 there, yet. There's so go two things it. that that make it really hard for the feds to prosecute. And I'm not talking about resources. I'm not talking about political will. Uh, those two things are, are this. They have to prove that uh, usually behind beyond a reasonable doubt that um, somebody, possibly more than one somebody's in a major crimes act case are Indians. And um, sometimes that's hard to and uh, you, especially if the person who is the defendant is not a uh, member of an Indian tribe, federally recognized tribe, uh, they have to go kind of jump through hoops to explain that they're a person who is a person of color with native ancestry and that they have some sort of governmental recognition and that they have to persuade 12 people. Well, I assure you the federal prosecution would make sure it doesn't have any Indians on it uh, to, to make a determination beyond a reasonable doubt if a defendant doesn't stipulate. 
Uh, the second part of this is, um, and this is also very difficult, is you have to show beyond a reasonable doubt that the crime occurred in Indian country. It's gonna be a lot easier in Oklahoma than it used to be. Uh, but in a lot of places where you have checkerboarded reservations, where the reservation has been disestablished or diminished, um, and you're not really sure where the defendant, where the defendant uh, committed the crime, it's really hard to show that. And if there's any kind of question on either of those issues, I assure you the federal government's gonna let that one go. That 98% conviction rate goes to hell if you have to start showing where Indian country is or that somebody is an Indian. Those are just two aspects to this um, that, com that complicate it from the federal government's uh, algorithm. Philip? Yeah, I, I was just gonna jump in and um, follow up on a point Julia made a little bit earlier. And, uh, you know, we, we certainly understand that the federal government, they like to win, they usually can, they get to pick their cases as well. Um, they are not, the federal prosecutors are not likely to decline to prosecute the, the murders that make all the front page headlines in Indian country. Those are going to be taken care of. They have the resources to go after those. It gets to the, the smaller crimes that may, you know, still fit under the Major Crimes Act or may not even be a major crime, maybe more on the level of a misdemeanor where um, you see in a lot of places, the federal government are not picking those up. I have talked to um, you know, people in the US Attorney's Office who say, we, we have a policy, uh, domestic violence in the Indian country in our jurisdictions, unless there's a broken bone, we can't prosecute. We don't have the people, we don't have the manpower. Well, there's a lot of things going on that need governmental intervention that don't rise to the level of a broken bone yet they they very well might in the course of time but you want to intervene early and if the federal government isn't providing the resources until it escalates to the murder where they you know they have all the uh, the facts there to to make it easy cleanup for them then the community is not being served and I, th I think you're seeing that a lot it has to go to you know up to 11 before the federal government is willing to take the case does McGirt only uphold the reservation provisions of the 1866 treaty? I would say yes. Looking at McGirt specifically, the holding of McGirt is that the Creek Nation's 1866 treaty reservation remains intact. The, uh, the, the, the follow-on cases that have been litigated in state and federal court are looking at the other tribal treaties in eastern Oklahoma specifically, and maybe in the course of time we'll see elsewhere but it's going to be tribe by tribe and treaty by treaty, whichever, you know, what the tribe thinks or the individual tribal member who's making the claim, what they think the, you know, operative treaty language establishes as a reservation, and then that's going to get litigated through. Okay. Um, so Matthew gave us kind of a preview of, um, in, in reverse, of some of the motion practice that people are going to have to become familiar with, right? Understanding how you litigate where a crime occurred, understanding how you litigate who is and is not a tribal member is gonna become a much bigger piece of practice. Thoughts about that, anybody? About what that looks like, about the resources that requires, about what the standards of proof are gonna be. Um, and I know we talked about this in our pre-call. I was blown away to find out that this is a jury issue, um, right? That I, I did not realize that, that um, Indian status is a jury issue, which means under Apprendi, it's going to have to go with everything else right to the jury. It's um, an is, element of the crime. So yeah. under the Major Crimes Act, Simulated Crimes Act, Indian Country Crimes Act, racial classification is the word Indian, which yeah. is, you might think is unconstitutional, but it's the, the, in the Constitution. Yeah, you kind, yeah, of but, kind of stuck with that, yeah. But so, you know, the courts, the Ninth Circuit has really hemmed and hawed over this. Uh, more conservative judges who normally are not civil rights war warriors, and I'm looking at you, Judge Kosinski, ex-Judge Kosinski, made a real big deal about this. And um, the reality is, there only a, a rule of thumb is only about half of people in the U.S. who are would, would probably fit the definition of Indian under the Major Crimes Act or the Indian Reorganization Act or any other statutes that use that phrase or that term. Um, are actually enrolled in a federally recognized tribe for mm -hmm. wide varieties of reasons. Mm -hmm. uh, but it, the, the Major Crimes Act is explicit. If any Indians who commit a crime, they can be federally prosecuted. So you have to show that that person is an Indian. So Julia, what is this going to look like? Who, who, who are going to be called as experts? And you're going to be going to be pretrial hearings on this, even though it's an element? I mean, what's going to happen? 
Oh, I don't think so. I mean, I, I do think in the preparation of a federal case, in my experience, the, the federal prosecutors um, come to a case very prepared. Um, it's not very frequently that we'll that I think we'll have to have to fight over that. It does happen. I mean, there you know, obviously it happens. There are cases out there that discuss it. Um, but I think if they have an issue, like it's already been said, if if a prosecutor sees an issue w with being able to prove whether someone's an Indian, they just will decline the case. That's the more likely, the most likely scenario, right? Okay. Um, I do think that that uh, one question that every every practitioner needs to ask is is should we do anything at all with cases that are all with with convicted cases. Should, should I be filing a post-conviction action? What should I do? Should I challenge my conviction? That's a really important question. I actually have had this happen in, in the recent past where someone called and asked me, I, I have this child neglect case and, and I, I just don't think she did it. And I really would like to try to withdraw my plea or get the conviction vacated. Well, on, on more discussion, what we learned was her client actually was on a deferred sentence, uh, not available in it, just not available. There, there is a possibility for a deferred prosecution. Those are incredibly rare in federal court. If you've got a deferred sentence in, in state court and you can successfully complete it and have your case expunged, leave it alone would generally be maybe the conclusion, right? And then there are other things, the extent of, of the punishment, what can happen, what might not happen, it, right, before, before you even think about what am I going to litigate, the question ought to be, should I litigate? So, so my question is, who's helping people figure that out? And this is not, not just my question. This was Tova Endritz's question that I'm stealing. But who's helping people figure this out? And I'm, I'm recalling, right? Um, after major federal court opinions, you know, after Booker Fan Fan, after you've had, you know, the First Step Act, the the influx, right, of pro se petitions, some of which turn out to be not so prudent because bad things can happen when cases get revisited. Um, and I imagine that those aren't just happening in your jurisdiction, Julia, but that they're going to start to happen in jurisdictions that haven't had McGirt rulings, where people are hoping that their case might be you know, the, the McGirt for their community. Who's helping people who have been convicted, who have no right to counsel, figure this out? You know, I know Toba and her committee, her NACDL committee are working on that. Ah, bounce it back to them. I like that strategy. Um, Ma Matthew, Philip, anybody aware of any plans to, to try and, and deal with this problem, um, both for people who are in the, the land that's covered by McGirt? And as I said, for folks who I promise you are sitting in, cells right now, um, figuring out how they're going to file their own pro se petitions um, on these issues? Well, I will say I do not know what has been happening on the ground in the last year or so. I will say that there was um, certainly a significant time gap between when the Tenth Circuit decided the Murphy case in 2016 and, um, you know, alerted everybody to the very real possibility that the federal courts would be recognizing this um, Indian country jurisdiction. In the time when the case was litigated all the way through the Supreme Court and Mr. McGirt's petition was taken up, when um, we didn't really discuss the Supreme Court procedures here, but the first case that went up was Murphy. It did not get a decision, um, presumably because the court was deadlocked for four. We had a recused justice. So there was um, a couple of years where the case was pending before we finally got Mr. McGirt's decision. The court actually looked to a number of cases that had been filed in the state system after the Tenth Circuit opinion, and we were keeping our eyes on those as well. And it was pretty clear that there was a lot of jailhouse lawyer involvement helping people file their petitions and the, the state courts were kind of just treating them with the rubber stamp treatment at the time. So during those years when you, you would think people might be ramping up and figuring out how to handle this, um, this Murphy and McGirt stuff, we saw, we saw jailhouse lawyers and we weren't really aware of anybody doing anything else at that time. What's happened since the Supreme Court finalized the decision, I do not know. Matthew, any ideas? You hearing anything? No, not on that issue. Although I, I would, I want to interject something, and I think it goes to Tilda's next question. 
um, which is what goes on in tribal courts. But you know, keep in mind that um, whenever you have one of these big reservation boundaries cases that, that involves a native person who is asserting some sort of immunity from state jurisdiction, um, it's not the tribes that are bringing these claims. You know, right. the, the tribes are either um, letting it happen or are happy that the you know that somebody who's committed a violent crime is in in state penitentiary. They're not going to do anything to upset that. They're certainly not going to put their reservation boundaries on the line for somebody who's a convicted felon. Mm -hmm. um, so the tribes are not the ones that are going to be leading this charge, and. Um, Maybe they shouldn't be able to be smart and prudent for tribes to think strategically about the right cases uh, that to lead the charge for uh, on these issues. But once the reservation boundaries are settled, then you don't have to worry about that. I think that this is a huge issue elsewhere in the country. Um, there's a case, uh, there are cases in Michigan being filed. None, other than one, no, two tribes out of the 12 in Michigan, uh, none of the tribes have settled reservation boundaries issues. They're all open questions. And mm -hmm. I guarantee you there are people in sitting in jail in state penitentiary who are thinking McGirt is their way out of prison. Mm -hmm. uh, the tribes need to be around the country need to be thinking about who is it from their community is going to be making this argument. Right. And uh, they need to be on the front end of this, but they're not. They're not going to do it. It just mm -hmm. it's just too much, I think. Well, it's a lot. I mean, um, and federal habeas corpus is itself such a, an unbelievable disaster. In fact, one question in my mind is, what is the Teague piece of this? I mean, are there are there Teague issues, Julia, that are kicking around here? I'm saying that habeas is way out of my realm. That, that that's, <laughs> you got to go find your shoe, huh? That's right. Okay. I get them when I I get them after they win. Okay. All right. So let me go back to this question then about folks who are in um, tribal courts. And we've got a couple of questions about it. One is about um, exhaustion doctrines and how exhaustion is going to play into habeas. And I know what your answer is going to be, Julia, which is go find someone in my in my habeas unit. Um, but but I think it's it's a worthwhile question to ask. And it does dovetail with that question that that Matthew alluded to, which is what about those folks who are facing charges um, in tribal courts? Well, I, I would, it's just funny that I was on a call about uh, the Supreme Court case in Oliphant versus Suquamish from 1978, a Native America calling a week or so ago, and Philva called in and asked about exactly this question of representation in tribal courts. You know, I think that there are tribes around the country that have resources are providing, going above and beyond what federal law requires in terms of the right to counsel in Indian country. There is, under the Indian Civil Rights Act, there is no right to indigent to counsel for indigent defendants. You're going to have an attorney. You got to pay for your own attorney. Um, I blame the United States government for that, from the Department of Justice, Department of Interior, in the 1960s when ICRA, the Indian Civil Rights Act, was adopted. Those are the agencies that fought to make sure that that was not included in ICRA. Probably, I suspect, conspiracy theory alert, that justice thought it could get. Um, Gideon v. Wainwright in those cases eventually reversed either by the Supreme Court or by Congress. And they didn't want Congress to ratify implicitly that decision by including it in the Indian Civil Rights Act. But I'll set that aside for a moment. What that means is there are lots of people in Indian country who are sentenced to jail who have never seen an attorney, never been entitled to an attorney under the Indian Civil Rights Act. Weirdly enough, in U.S. v. Bryant just four years ago, uh, the Supreme Court said that was totally fine. So long as you comply, tribes, with the Indian Civil Rights Act, you haven't done, you haven't violated federal law. Um, and you can actually use those uncounseled convictions uh, under 18 U.S.C. 11, 117 to, to, to enhance a sentence for somebody who is a domestic violence or recidivist domestic violence offender. I don't know if that's a good or a bad thing, um, but my sense is, I don't know, I don't think it's a good thing or certainly for the right to counsel. Um, I'm all in favor of right to counsel. I sit as an appellate judge. I don't get a lot of criminal cases for the tribes I work for. But here in Michigan, if you, the moment that before an arraignment, at the beginning of the arraignment, the first question of the judge's mouth, the tribal judge's mouth in Michigan is, prosecutor, are you going to be seeking any jail time whatsoever? And if the answer is yes, the right to counsel attaches at that moment. And the tribes do pay for indigent counsel in Michigan. That's the, that's the gold standard. That's what you absolutely have to do. We do that in Michigan, but uh, we have the tribes have resources, and they also don't spend a lot of time seeking jail. So that's not true in a lot of places in Indian country. It should be, but it's not. 
Yeah, and I'll, I'll note here that, in fact, there are a lot of places in Indian country where if you're going to get a public defender, it comes in, in the Tuliap tribe, it comes from a law clinic that a, that a law school's put together. It comes from volunteer legal services. Um, I'm a former clinical professor. I believe in it, but that ain't the way you provide public defense for an entire community, right? It's a, it's a learning experience for students. It's not a substitute for providing people with a federal or a state or a tribal defender, depending on what the forum is. So what's next? Um, we, we, there, there are two new decisions out. There are new cases kicking around. If I were to ask you, you know, we'll play like, um, you know, on wait, wait, don't tell me. And I'm going to ask you in, in three to five years, what are we going to be talking about when it comes to, to tribal sovereignty and criminal law? Um, what, what are the issues we're going to be looking at? What's going to have happened? We're going to do a lightning round here, me and my Peter Sagal role. Well, I've got to put in a pitch for uh, vowel reauthorization. The bill came out the other day, and it's a broad expansion of uh, the jurisdiction that tribes will have over non-Indians. That's broad, meaning if you comply with all the other uh, the other requirements that only a few dozen tribes can actually comply with, um, it will expand the uh, number of crimes that uh, you know that non-Indians can be charged with in tribal court. We'll be talking about that in three years, regardless. So. All right. I just VAWA on the list. Philip, what else? I think we're going to be talking about collaborative criminal justice and law enforcement. I think um, there, there are going to be a lot of litigation just in the next couple of years establishing that those reservation boundaries are intact. I think people are going to wise up. They're going to figure out that the law is very, very simple, as Matthew said early in this conversation. If there's a treaty or a statute, establishing a reservation, and there's no subsequent treaty or statute directly and explicitly taking it away, there is a reservation, and that's the jurisdictional threshold. And so rather than continuing to fight about whether or not that is Indian country, it's going to be much more of a collaborative process between states, tribes, and the federal government to figure out how are we going to more effectively provide criminal justice in these reservations, because it's going to be a light bulb coming on, you know, shining a light on issues that have remained dormant in, in so many reservations across the country, because all of a sudden in Oklahoma, in large jurisdictions, places where they didn't think there was a reservation, there is, people are going to pay attention and then they're going to figure out how do we actually handle this. Okay, so we know who the optimist in the crowd is. All right. We had optimism. The case wouldn't have gone up. I can say no, that I know. Right Listen, I, I, I admire it, but so so. But the collaborative piece is a really interesting bit to imagine. You know, and and I would like to build on that because I, I what I would hope we would see in in the next future um, couple years is a collaboration when it comes to juvenile justice. Oh. Right. I mean, the, right now, uh, the federal government is. Woefully, wo woefully, I mean, um, ill-equipped to deal with any juvenile offender, um, any juvenile offender. That has absolutely positively has to change, especially um, when we consider that the entire purpose of, of the Juvenile Justice Act is, is to set young people on the right path. It's about rehabilitation. Uh, we've, we've, got to, we've got to work together with the tribes and the state to, to uh, build a system that provides um, necessary services to, to redirect young people. Um, and that's what I hope to see. Let me double down on that for a second. And I think this is probably a question for Matthew. Um, how do you make sure that happens without participating in the kind of um, deliberate stripping away of culture, the, de the deliberate imposition of external cultural values um, in a system that's not historically been very good at dealing with Indian youth? Yeah, I don't know. You, you don't. Um, you know, the, if you look at the tribal court cases, the appellate court cases that I put in, some of them I put in my case book on uh, criminal justice, criminal civil rights, uh, you know, criminal uh, procedure rights, uh, other than a few outlier cases, they're all, they're all the same as federal courts. Um, tribes have already, if by, by moving in the direction of the adversarial process, the, the justice system that, that is similar to, effectively similar to a copy of uh, state and federal justice systems. The tribes have already given a lot of that up. Um, and, and to continue to, to require tribes um, in order to ha have enhanced sentencing and ju additional jurisdiction over non-Indians, uh, ironically, uh, that will make it, make, make it even worse. 
weirdly enough, though, the way Congress is thinking about criminal justice right now, they're actually a little bit ahead of the curve than most of the states are, certainly Oklahoma. For example, the judges under Tribal Law and Order Act and VAWA, the judges have to be uh, licensed as lawyers somewhere. And you know, there's several thousand judges around the country who, uh, who are not lawyers. Local justices of the peace and magistrates are elected. Um, who are not lawyers to to handle probably a misdemeanor docket, but so yeah. you actually have to have a defender. You actually have to have a law trained defender, law trained prosecutor, law trained judge to be prosecuted if you're a non Indian in Indian country. Mm -hmm. um, ironically, that's a higher standard than probably uh, as a practical matter, pretty much everywhere else outside of federal court. Well, thank you for that, and I think those are really points well taken. Um, I'm going to, we're going to time, just about time to wrap up, um, but I, I want to ask if um, anybody has any other thoughts about um, next steps, really practically. I know, Julia, you talked a little bit about resourcing. Um, what are the next steps the, the federal system should be taking? Well, you know, there, my, my, my real focus is just from the defense piece of it, right? Mm -hmm. um, I think a lot's going to have to be done to build a, ro a robust, much larger, robust Criminal Justice Act panel of conflict attorneys for um, any district that's affected by um, an increase in this type of, uh, of case. Julia, right. what's, what's the approximate split you're seeing in defendants who are Indian versus non-Indian? You mean, at, in, like as of today, I, I, I would say that what's being filed right here right now is, is probably eight to one native defendants. Um, or I, I will say major crimes act cases because a few of those are, are, are also Indian victims. But, but that's not a fair representation at all because what we're seeing at this moment in time is that flood of cases, right, that are pending in state court that look so, like they'll be dismissed. So are specialized um, mitigators, investigators, um, part of what you envision as being necessary to provide the appropriate representation? Well, I think that it's, that it's always important to have uh, the right type of investigation in every case. Most of our federal teams would include some sort of uh, mitigation one way or the other, especially now that um, federal sentencing guidelines aren't mandatory. Mm -hmm. right. So um, the other thing I think that's going to have to happen and happen soon will be a, a, a establishment of full-time federal defender office in the Eastern District of Oklahoma and in the Northern right now, it's, it's a combined office. I, I represent all the defendants in both districts because when it was established, there weren't enough um, cases to justify a single office. So they, the, the, the two courts joined forces and agreed to, to form a, a joint office. Mm -hmm. uh, but this explosion of cases is going to, to, to really change the nature of the work and most particularly in the Eastern District of Oklahoma. Yeah, and I think I that we'll get to the point soon where we have to have a standalone office there. And I guess we should also point out that it's changing the type, the, I assume it's going to change the proportionally the types of crimes that are being prosecuted and handled in your jurisdiction, by which I mean, you know, these are, these are le more like what we would have called a state case and less like what we would call a federal case in many ways. So it's going to change in some ways the nature of the practice, yes? Sure, and particularly in the Eastern District, the, the number of Major Crimes Act cases, which are, like you say, state court type cases, but crimes of violence, crimes that are resource intensive, those will far outnumber the typical federal prosecution for stealing the mail or, yeah. right, things like that. Mm -hmm. You know, I do think it's important to note, though, that Mr. McGirt has been tried. It, Right, his, his case went to trial quickly. He's been convicted of three counts. He's awaiting sentencing. All right, Philip, your thoughts about what else the federal government is gonna to need to bring to bear here? Um, beyond what I mentioned earlier in terms of just juicing up the resources available, um, both for the transition and then for the, the new reality going forward and sitting down with the tribes to really hash out how they're going to, you know, work on this, um, you know, renewed need for cooperative law enforcement. 
I think I think the cooperative piece of it and the resources piece of it are are the two things to be looking at. Um, certainly on the tribe side as well, we've we've talked about um, the tribal justice systems and the need to to make sure those are up to par. I do I do want to just make sure it's mentioned that all of the five tribes have very well developed court systems. They have good codes of law that I think are going to be um, a good foundation for uh, you know meeting the the new influx of cases that they're going to be seeing. Certainly they're gonna be seeing the same exponential rise in cases that the federal court is seeing. And so there's gonna be some work that has to be put in to make sure that that's updated to accommodate that. There are gonna be some, some changes in tribal codes and tribal constitutions maybe to make sure that the language is sufficient to reach the full territorial jurisdiction. Uh, there's gonna be a lot of effort that needs to be put into that. Yeah, Matthew, I'm going to switch course a little bit and ask you from a lawyer's perspective, I mean, textualism now in these cases means something entirely different, right? Can you talk, <laughs> I mean, can you talk about what that, because it that's, I mean, I think you've called it a sea change. Yeah, so I think in Indian law, um, since 2014, you have probably five, maybe even six cases where the Supreme Court has basically what Indian countries always ask the Supreme Court to do, which is just follow the law. And the law is that uh, reservation boundaries, treaty rights, sovereign immunity, the inherent powers of tribes, um, all of those things remain extant and untouched unless Congress uh, makes its intent to modify or abrogate those rights, powers, etc. cetera, um, unless Congress makes its intent to do any of that to affect those uh, rights or powers, makes it clear. And um, that, that changes everything in Indian law. Uh, that is a signal McGirt is the fact that McGirt has gotten so much attention is a very strong signal that um, people, judges in, in the lower courts in particular, know about McGirt. They want to know more about it. And they want to know what it means. And what it means is the Supreme Court signal to the lower court, state and federal, is, um, you know, we're not going to intervene when just because it doesn't look good. We're not going to say, well, tribes are really not not competent anymore to handle cases, so we're not going to let them ha handle cases. It's not up to the judiciary anymore. Public policy is a matter for Congress to be negotiated in Indian affairs with Indian tribes themselves. Mm -hmm. uh, the states don't have anything to say about it. Um, they have, they can say anything they want, but they cannot. <laughs> they don't have the authority to modify uh, mm -hmm. on their own the relationship between the United States and tribes. And that is a function of textualism, um, mm -hmm. the, the the kind of textualism that is much more. Um, stout than say the textualism of Justice Scalia. Scal Justice Scalia is the famed guy who introduced textualism, made it popular, made it influential on the Supreme Court, wrote a book called The Little Matter of Interpretation where he described what his textualism is. I've read that. I read what he said in The, the Little Matter of Interpretation. What he said was, as soon as the text, the statute, the treaty, whatever, becomes ambiguous, all bets are off. I can do whatever I want. That's 98% of the Supreme Court's docket. He, he was playing a game of uh, hide the ball big time when it came to textualism. Now, Justice Gorsuch is a textualist in that a uh, minimalist textualist, um, a textualist kind of like what Chief Justice Roberts is. Uh, it's not there to put the Supreme Court and the judiciary in the forefront of making policy. It's a step back, let these things happen first. And if there's a dispute between the courts below, uh, they'll take those cases. Indian law is a really easy outcome. If the judiciary knows where its role is, its role is ext extremely limited. Thanks, Matthew. We have a, another question about the right to counsel. And the question is, um, gonna, I'm gonna ask it to each of you. Um, do you favor amending the Indian Civil Rights Act, excuse me, to add a right to counsel and funding to support that right? Um, Philip? That's a, uh, that's a tough question because it involves just looking at the Indian Civil Rights Act as it exists right now and making a small tweak. Uh, you know, certainly Matthew was discussing earlier that a lot of tribal justice systems have moved very heavily towards the Western adversarial model. And a lot of that can be attributed to the Indian Civil Rights Act, which gives tribal court defendants the right to seek habeas relief in federal court on a, uh, on a sentence that involves incarceration. The more the tribal justice system mirrors the federal and state justice systems, the more likely that uh, that's going to be to be held up by the federal courts on appeal. So that it's a, it's a 
pressure and imposition to mirror the, um, you know, the Western model. And it's not that great a model if you look at the, uh, at the, uh, at the, you know, very significant problem of incarceration in this country. I'm not saying not providing defendants counsel is a good <laughs> step at ameliorating that. So within the mostly westernized model that we have right now, as Matthew said, the gold standard is you provide people with defense, you know, it's the least we can do to somebody that we're going to lock up. So I'll leave it at that, I suppose. Okay, Matthew. Yeah, um, I, uh, you know, I'm, 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 I would never object to Congress modifying the Indian Civil Rights Act to provide for a right to counsel, or even just to go through the Indian Bill of Rights and really enhance it. They actually have multiple times now, the Tribal Law and Order Act of 2010, the Dabawa 2013. So uh, I think all of that is a good thing. Uh, but I think the real change in, in criminal jurisdiction, criminal justice in the US, you could start in Indian country, I'd be happy with that, uh, is to start thinking about policing, uh, it's to start thinking about the kinds of things that governments can do to prevent the conditions that people live under that leads to crime. Mm -hmm. stuff like poverty, discrimination, you know, all of those things are the, the fundamental cause of all of this. And uh, we can throw all, as many lawyers as we possibly can at it. We can uh, have as many defender and the public defender as there are in, in federal prosecution, uh, but we're still going to have the same problems. And um, the, 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 you know, the retributive form of justice in our country that gets uh, people elect reelected uh, elected and reelected to state and federal positions of power is a serious, a serious problem. You know, interestingly, in Indian country, um, you can see the politics are a lot different. Um, one thing you don't see in Indian country is tribal judges very often. Once in a while, somebody says that a 17-year-old got charged, but prosecutors know better than go to a tribal judge and say, we want to charge this 14-year-old as an adult. Motion denied. Don't even ask mm -hmm. a question like that in Indian country. It's disgusting. Children are are creature, supernatural creatures. They're uh, beyond that kind of uh, ridiculous contempt that, that state and local prosecutors often evoke when it comes to juvenile justice. Similarly, tribal leaders do not get elected because they go around telling people they're gonna put more people in jail, mm -hmm. um, that they're looking for justice and revenge for crimes that are committed in Indian country. Not very, very often. They mostly get elected because they promise higher gaming per caps more than anything. But it, that's a, a, a different kind of culture, uh, cultural and governmental background that I think a lot of us could learn from outside of Indian country as well. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Um, and I'll just throw out there, you know, and it might be a different kind of public defender, right? That, that learns to work in that kind of a culture. Julia. Oh, I think that's what I was going to say. Uh, if, if there's going to be a system that's anything like the system that I work in, it doesn't work without zealous defense counsel, uh, gotta have it. And I think, you know, to, to Matthew's point about, you know, kind of thinking differently, and this is Philip's point as well, thinking differently about what a justice system looks like. Um, I think there's a fair question to be asked about whether the public, the tr traditional public defender model that we have, right, which is at its core adversarial confronting you know, a system that has far greater resources, far more power, the kind of coercive power of, of plea bargaining and all those things. Um, you know, I think it's a real thought experiment to wonder what would a defender look like in a different sort of a system? What, what does that mean? Yeah, I, I, well, I don't have an answer to that one. I, I have yet I, to see I, that. I, I want to toss out one idea, which is, uh, has nothing to do specifically with public defenders, but um, in the year 2000, Congress, until the year 2000, the Interior Department actually had control over uh, who could be hired as a lawyer representing an Indian tribe. Now, they weren't exercising that authority much in the 90s and, uh, and 80s and 90s, but actually it was law in the books. You could not, mm -hmm. your, your attorney contract was void unless the Secretary of the Interior approved it. Um, what that meant was after 2000, tribes have run over uh, professional responsibility in Indian country. And one of the things tribes have not done is done anything about that outside of places like the Navajo Nation, which is a mm -hmm. huge bar and a bar exam. Uh, tribes could really rethink uh, the ABA model rules, take what works for tribal communities, remove what, what doesn't work for tribal communities. There's stuff in the model rules about the obligations of prosecutors, stuff in the model rules about the obligations of representing uh, organizational clients. Tribes could really 
really rethink what goes on in Indian country in a way that could be really effective. I don't know what that would look like. And I think it would be rooted in what uh, tribes believe is a, res a dispute resolution that is more culturally appropriate. I wish they would think about it. It's one of those things like every, every tribal community has the same problems in that we're all reactive and we don't think about it in advance, um, but the potential is definitely there. That's a fascinating idea. And I, I you know, did, I assume that one of the challenges is, is that when there are so many resource needs, it's hard to turn to something like a code of professional responsibility. Yeah. When when you're when you're working on on other things, but sounds like an excellent seminar class, doesn't it? I got one. We're doing it in Michigan next year. Really? Um, yeah, next spring. I think we're. It's going to be primarily about policing. Really, they have a problem solving class, and we're going to do an Indian Country Criminal Justice um, wow. seminar. Oh, how wonderful! That sounds fascinating. You sign me up, and I'll remote in just to learn. Right. Not to, yeah. I, well, I want to thank you all so very much. This has been a fascinating discussion. I think, as, as somebody said at the beginning, this is just the very beginning of the conversation, right? We don't, we don't know yet where McGirt is going to land us. We don't know what's going to happen to the defendants who are right now um, filing motions. But when I was prepping for this, I saw a number of private law firms that have these big banners on their web pages that says, attention defendants. McGirt <laughs> means you can, you can <laughs> try and have your conviction overturned. Um, and I could feel Julia wincing um, through, through the Zoom when I see those. But there's a lot to be said and a lot to, to come. And we can't wait to see what, what all of you um, are going to do. And I hope we'll be able to check back in with you all and hear what, what's happening in your worlds. Um, I want to thank you all so much for your time. Um, I know many of you have been asked to do this over and over and over again since McGirt. I suspect it's a cottage industry. Um, for Matthew right now, I know. Um, <laughs> Julia's got her hands full and Philip, I think, has more cases coming down the pike um, and in conversations with a lot of different people. And so I know this is a big commitment of time for you at a, at a moment when the very subject we're talking about is making work for you. And so we're incredibly grateful to you for joining us. Thank you all so much.